although not real timely. So yeah, I saw other folks joining. Hey Emily, hey Hongyu, Will, Hi everyone. See you. So well, it's five. Yeah, it's five past. So we don't want to take you know um, take up. Um, too much of your time here. So, um, uh, Dr. Seigen, please, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am a doctoral intern at the Counseling Center. Um, I will be going on to postdoc in private practice in August, but um, I'm absolutely loving, loving my time here at Georgia State. Um, I have done, I don't know if this is relevant, I guess it is. My uh, dissertation is on the use of virtual reality to facilitate and uh, increase mindfulness. So, you know, for individuals who have difficulty concentrating or are mindfulness novices or have difficulty maybe with attention, um, or just sometimes people can't visualize sitting on the bank of a river. So um, I investigated whether or not virtual reality would help facilitate that. So um, stress management is something that this is, I think, the third or fourth time I've done this presentation. I absolutely love talking about it. I also um, I, I am in I'm in a doctoral grad program also, so I am very well aware of the stressors that come along with this. And for the next 55 minutes, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it, what the, you know, the biological function is, also how we can help combat that. But also, I am also, I'm very interactive. Listening to just me talk for an hour is super boring for me. So I'm going to ask you guys to participate when I'm asking a question. I really do want to hear your answers. They are not, I do not give rhetorical questions. So I'm going to share my screen with you and we will go from there if I have sharing capabilities. So I have that. Let's see. Let me um, check on that. I do. Okay. Works. Great. Awesome. Can you guys see? Yes. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So. The biggest one is what is stress, right? Stress is our life demands. And it's when our life demands outweigh our tools for coping with these life demands. So everybody has things, you know, we do have um, an evolutionary basis for stress. We needed to be able, back when we were living in caves and we were living in like thatched huts and things like that, if we were encountering a tiger in the wild, we needed our stress to get away from it. We needed our body's biological stress to do that. We needed to have that stress of not being able to eat, to go out and actually hunt and forage for food and things like that. We needed those stressors to keep us moving and keep us going. Nowadays, hopefully you are not encountering a tiger in your daily life. <laughs> hopefully you are not encountering violent, vicious animals that are much bigger and better adapted to that kind of thing than we are. But our metaphoric tigers take the place of school stressors, family responsibilities, bills, financial stress, all of these things like that. And those are our tigers, so to speak. Um, so when we're stressed out, we have a fight or flight response system. This is our sympathetic nervous system. And this activates in an effort to rapidly mobilize and also conserve energy so that we can cope with these demands. There's a lot of different ways that this can affect us. I'll go over the physical, the cognitive, and the behavioral components that go into like our body, our biological makeup when we are stressed. And it can really have an impact on your overall health. And overall health meaning your cognitive, physical, emotional, and behavioral health as well. So for college students, especially with grad program, you know, you have your academic demands, there's peer pressure, um, financial concerns, maybe there's some cultural concerns going on, especially with the last year, it's been very socially and, and culturally um, intense <laughs> over the last year. We also have our interpersonal relationships, trying to figure out how we're gonna balance it. Maybe you're trying to decide what your dissertation is gonna be on or how you're actually gonna get that completed. Um, I know for my program with psychology, we do a lot of conferences. So there's a big emphasis on research and not only doing your own dissertation research, but also 
independent research and joining clubs and, and collaborating with people and then presenting your work in conferences and things like that. And so that's an added stressor as well. So not all stress is bad, right? Some stress, just like when we were, you know, in our, in our early humanhood, some stresses actually help us push ourselves and to meet goals and to study more and to work hard and to stick with those challenging tasks. It's when it reaches an unhealthy level that it can actually prevent us from functioning well or meeting our goals. So there are there actually is positive stress. That's eustress. We don't really hear that word very often. Um, but that's that's that positive stress. That's that good stress. That's the one that's going to make sure that you're studying because you know that you have, um, you know, maybe a conference coming up or you need to prep for something and you want to make sure that it's really going to help focus that energy and focus yourself. And usually it's short term, but it will help you improve your performance. Like I need to do well, so I'm going to prep and I'm going to rehearse and I'm going to do all these things that I need to do in order to succeed and do this really, really well. And then you have our de-stress, which that is more you know, common for, for people. And that's what doesn't feel good. That's the one that's unpleasant. This is short or long term. It just depends on what's going on and what the actual distress is. And it can actually cause anxiety. So stress in and of itself, it's just an event that makes you upset, nervous, or overwhelmed. But it's over when the event is over. So let's say you have a speech to give or a presentation to give. That stress that you have should end, or should, we'll say with air quotes, would end when the presentation is completed. The anxiety lingers after that stressor is gone. And that's when you start to feel that fear and uneasiness or that worry way after that event is already over. So I want to know, guys, what is stress? How are you stressed? Are you what is stressing you out right now? Say so the, the juggle, the constant juggle of, I don't know, papers, research. I'm, I'm not taking classes, but I know a lot of people here are um, teaching all of that. It's personal life, everything, mental health, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, similarly, I, 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 I got really stressed out by a homework, which a, a course I took at Georgia Tech, and I didn't expect. I planned to work on it for two hours, but it take like my whole evening, whole afternoon. I haven't figured out even a quarter of the problem. I just, oh, I'm stupid. I'm, I'm lazy. I should have I just feel like uh, then I would escalate the problem to all oh, whether I can finish my PhD then it must be my problem so it's sort of like compounding factor absolutely absolutely and and um I'm just feeling a lot of pressure to get published and you know it's so intimidating and vulnerable when you are trying to finish it up and and get the review back and everything yeah absolutely always having a hard time trying to come up with the right research questions. Um, I have lots of points, but I can't currently having trouble with connect either connecting the dots or if I have the dots, uh, my data is not suitable to answer that question. So it's still juggling back and forth, um, going back to the trying to formulate a question and um, realizing or realizing the data is not there or um, trying to come up with a story from the data, but um, the story that I can come up with the existing data is not interesting enough. So it's hitting the walls um, in a very short terms very frequently. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's a really good point, too, is, you know, when you see the data, because I did my own research design for my dissertation, too. So, you know, what's out there, you know, like the research and the literature that's already out there and then your data is not matching. And it's like, OK, so what did I do? Right. It, it goes right to you. <laughs> it's, it's all internalized. Right. 
Yeah, that's exactly what's happening right now. Um, it's it's a very straightforward, very simple experiment, but it's, it's not um, significant. So uh, the obvious reaction is, what am I doing wrong? Exactly, exactly. Yes. It, when really in reality, absolutely, probably nothing, right? It's just the way that the data is. And that's that's the trouble with data and research is that sometimes it's just not significant, you know? But those are not the things that we see get published. And then when you have that that pressure of being published, it's like we've got to find something. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, great examples. Yes. Great. Yeah. Now, certainly, it's a way to the stress. Like you would have constantly have the peer pressure that seeing others are doing so well, and uh, if like, oh, I'm not doing enough, and. Uh, whether I should catch up the new opportunity to do more, but on the, it will distract uh, yourself focusing on currently what you are doing. So that's just make things worse. Yeah, com exactly. Comparing yeah, everyone story. in this room right now is the source of my stress in that point. <laughs> <that sense. laughs> you guys are all over overachievers. They, they're too productive. That's like comparing is hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Very because like, we know we're not supposed to do it, but it's really hard not to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. And then when somebody does have, um, or like somebody comes up with a research question and you're like, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? Of course. And then they get published and you're like, ah, uh, clearly they're smarter and better and everything. I, you know, I'm just going to go sit over here, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Great examples. Absolutely. I'm feeling that because I collected data for my dissertation. So I felt that. <laughs> so these are some things that we've already talked about, right? So what happens to us cognitively when we start getting stressed out? We start criticizing ourselves. Why couldn't I figure that out? Why am I not smart enough to do this? Why am I incapable of making my data bend to the will of my research question? Why can't I do this? that's gonna take a toll on your self-esteem. I'm not smart enough to be in this program. I'm not, I'm not doing this. Or maybe that preoccupation with the future. If I don't get published, or if we're all, all of us in this program are all going for the same dozen jobs, and I am not getting published and my cohort people are, then I'm never gonna get a job. I'm never gonna get this, this fellowship. I'm never gonna get this. I'm gonna end up living in a bridge, underneath a bridge, in a box, and then, I mean, it just the preoccupation with the future just can get over and over again. And that's where that those repetitive thoughts of why can't I get this to do what I want it to do? That fear of failure and that rigid thinking of I need to get this done or I need to do this. And then that relaxation can cause or that lack of relaxation can cause some confusion, maybe a difficulty making decisions. You start getting distracted or have unrealistic expectations of yourself because you're not you're, it's not doing what you're wanting it to do. That stress is making, you know, that, that confusion. Our thoughts influence everything, right? Our entire being is, it lives right up here on the very, very top of us. And oftentimes when we have those repetitive thoughts, we start thinking about our thinking, right? So if we start thinking, why am I so stressed out? Why can't I get this done? Why am I worrying about this? I shouldn't be worrying about this. What does it say to, about me that I'm worrying about this one thing, right? So you start thinking about the thoughts that you're having and it just becomes this never ending cycle of thinking about thinking. And that's what we call metacognition. There's also filtering. This tends to be, this happens when we magnify all those negative aspects of a situation and we filter out all the positive ones. So you guys are all PhD fellows. So you've gotten to the point now where you know this stuff, right? But let's say one thing happens, or let's say you get, you're in a discussion, you're in a class and somebody calls on you and you don't get the answer 100% correct. And a teacher corrects you or says, oh, that's a good point. You know, also there's this, 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 this. And for the rest of the day, all you're doing is thinking about the question you got wrong. <laughs> Any of the questions you've gotten correct, 
not what has gotten you here. Clearly you're confident in your program or else you wouldn't be where you are right now. But all you think about is that question you didn't answer 100% correctly, right? Filtering out all of the other positive things that you've done to get yourself where you are. Personalizing is blaming yourself when things go wrong. And this is what we were talking about before, is that when your data is not doing what you want it to do, it's my fault. I'm doing something wrong, right? This can also happen in your personal life. So let's say that you are, you were invited somewhere, pre, you know, let's say post COVID and we're all like actually back out in the world where we can talk to people in person. So you're all out and all of a sudden plans get canceled. It could be that you think to yourself, they really just didn't want to hang out with me. They just didn't want, you know, they didn't want to go out and spend time with me today. But it's that blaming yourself. Catastrophizing is just anticipating the worst. So one small thing happens, and this is like where I I done the if I don't if I don't get my data to do what I want it to, then I'm gonna fail out of the program. And if I fail out of the program, then everybody like my family's gonna disown me, and then my friends are gonna disown me, and everyone's gonna, and then I'm gonna live under a bridge. You've anticipated the worst that's gonna happen. And then polarizing is viewing things as all good or all bad without that gray area in between. So very rarely are things all bad or all good. Usually there is a gray area. There's some, it depends kind of attitude somewhere in the middle of that. But when we have those thoughts of, so this is the, this didn't go the way I wanted it to, therefore I'm a failure, right? I didn't answer that one question, so I'm a failure. There's no learning curve in your, in your thoughts at all. So any of these things live in your body? The answer is 100% yes, this lives in your body. So these are some things that can happen. I want to hear where does all of your stress live in your body? Right here. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know if that was just computer related or like. I'm going to have the most amazing neck muscles by the end of my, I'm going to be like Dr. Neck Muscle because it's like all here. Just, yeah. Yeah, right here. Yep. Where you do a lot of this all day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I get migraines. Anybody else get headaches? Oh, yeah. I got one last night. And I had another <laughs> weird um, way of display stress is every night that I have super weird dreams that I that can make me even write a fantasy book novel, maybe if I can use it as dissertation. <laughs> I don't know. Every night I would have <laughs> super weird. Yes. Anybody get stress dreams? Oh, mm -hmm. stress dreams are the worst. Yeah. When I was about to defend my dissertation for a week, I had stress dreams that I failed. Yeah, but that's it. Upset stomach. Some people just like they feel nauseous all the time or you end up getting some tummy trouble. Um, just just constant feeling of just exhaustion, right? Just like, I just, oh, I'm so tired. I need a vacation. I need, if I never look at my computer again, it'll be too soon. Yeah, absolutely. And these are some emotional indicators that we have, right? So we start feeling anxious. Maybe there's depression. For some time, sometimes we're just irritable. We're just cranky and grumpy and we don't want to talk to anybody. We don't really want to do anything, but we don't know why, right? It's just like, you know, I'm just in a bad mood. Um, you could also maybe feel some embarrassment, some shame, you know, just depending on what it is that's going on that's stressing you out. Maybe you're thinking that, you know, I should be able to handle my workload and my academic load and my personal life. I should be able to do this. And, and it's embarrassing that I can't, right? So then we have our behaviors. Our behaviors, we could maybe start withdrawing from others. Like, I just can't hang out. Like, I can't talk to anybody right now. I just need to live inside my mind and just get this done. Um, if you're really irritable, if you're cranky all the time, maybe you're having some fights with people, you know, your loved ones or your social circle. You're lashing out and you know you don't mean to and you're feeling bad about it, but you might just be snapping at people and you don't mean to be doing it. Um, maybe you're increasing your caffeine, right? Or hopefully you're not doing this, but there are cases of people that will take um, Adderall that's not prescribed to them because they like, I need to focus. And so you end up taking medication that's not actually prescribed to you. Um, maybe like, it, I don't know if anybody else says this, but if you end up clenching your jaw, like, you know, that teeth grinding, clenching your jaw, sometimes we'll end up inadvertently like balling our fists up. 
You know, you ever do that? You ever notice all of a sudden, why is my hand so tense? And then you go, oh, wait, let me flex my fingers out because they've been balled up and I didn't realize that they were doing it. Um, you might be working harder, but actually getting less done or maybe the quality of your work is just not the way it used to be or the way that you would want it to be. So then your quality of work goes down. This is a huge one. So nutrition and stress. If you think of our stress response, there's the, actually the AP, uh, HPA axis, and that is your hypothalamus to your um, pituitary to your adrenal glands. And this acts like, it, what it does is it releases cortisol into your bloodstream. Now, I like to talk about cortisol kind of like an energy loan shark. It'll give you what you need in the moment, so when you're stressed out, your cortisol is, that's what's helping you, you know, stay awake and stay motivated and, and, and that's the stress response that's that stress hormone it also wants its energy back yesterday and it doesn't care how it gets it so this cortisol actually has a craving tied to it and that craving you end up eating foods that are high in fat salt and sugar so anybody that's really stressed out, if you're just like, oh, I just need a burger, like I'm just going to eat a burger or fries or something fatty or your comfort food, whatever your comfort food is, that's what that is. And that cortisol wants that energy back and it wants it back now. It doesn't care how, how it gets it. It wants it back now. So that's where maybe some unhealthier food options start to wean their way into your into your diet then can cause other things like maybe, you know, gaining like weight fluctuations, or maybe you just don't feel good or the stress is causing maybe you to break out or something. And then it's, then you have a whole other layer of, of stress and anxiety. So these are symptoms of chronic stress and burnout. We've got, you know, heart attacks, high blood pressure, strokes, migraines, chronic pain, sleep disorders, all kinds of these things. Basically nobody wants any of this. So, we're going to work. We're going to talk about what do you do to de-stress? What are you guys, what are your current coping skills right now? What is it that you guys do? Exactly that. Okay. I do yoga. <laughs> you do yoga. Okay. I like to do uh, a workout once in a while or go out for a short walk or talk to my yeah. partner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I like to take my dog on a walk. I like to go for runs. Awesome. So I'm hearing exercise. Exercising. In <laughs> exercising in outdoors. I mean, I also uh, let my <laughs> kids walk me out. That's good. Eat, Anybody eat, eat. cuddle up with their pets? Like, I just need to pet my cat right now. Like, <laughs> it just need, it just need my pet. Although my cat don't doesn't like it. <laughs> <I feel> like <laughs> so it's, like, it's like holding a struggling, it's like, let me love you. <laughs> I do that with my plants. I don't have pets, but I have plants now. <laughs> well, the plant can't struggle as much as the cat can. So that's good. Yep. <laughs> so that's great. So when it comes to managing stress, it's not so much, it's mostly an issue of control is really what it boils down to. Um, you may be able to have some control over your environment, maybe like the things that you look at or the way the way that you orient yourself in your room or your office where you can maybe stare out of a window. Um, we, ha unfortunately, we have limited to no control over others. You know, um, if we did, life would be a lot easier for us if we could, uh, could you know, mind control people, but it, that's just not realistic. Um, we can control ourselves. That's what we can control. So we can control how we sh how we perceive things, the way we think about it, um, what we're doing to de-stress, and who is in our support system, right? The mo one of the things that we can do is decide, is this a problem I actually need to solve? Is this something that's going to go away on its own with time? Or is this something that I, that, you know, what is the problem? And what am I going to do to solve it? Apparently somebody's doing lawn maintenance out, outside, so I am so sorry if you guys can hear that. So what's the problem and what are the possible solutions? This is where we get to play a little bit of a what if game, um, but the possible solutions of what is going on. 
then what are the consequence of, consequences of each one of our solutions? And then which one are you gonna choose? And then did it work? And if it worked, great. So the biggest one is gonna be what's the problem? Because we do have to pick our battles, right? We can't address every single problem that we have every single moment of the day because we would be exhausted. So we really have to decide, is this like time oriented? Do I need to get this done right now? Or can this wait a little bit? Or by the time that the little bit has come and gone, my good, do I actually need to address this? When it comes to where our tension and our stress is living in our body, sometimes it helps really just to take a minute in the middle of the day. And using STOP as an acronym is, is a good way to kind of remind yourself to really just take a minute, give yourself a nice deep breath, observe if there's any tension, maybe like, are you clenching your jaw? Is, are your you know shoulders living up by your ears? Have you been balling your fist up all day? And really being purposeful in relaxing that, maybe stretching, maybe giving yourself a second to, you know, move around a little bit and then going about your day. Just taking those little check-ins throughout the day can really help because you're like, you know, maybe I haven't eaten all day and maybe that's why I'm cranky or I can't focus. When was the last time I had a drink of water? Have I actually scheduled bathroom breaks into my day? You know, things like that that can really add up and help you out. One of the other things is deep breathing. When we are stressed out, we live in our upper chest. I'm gonna adjust my camera just a little bit. We live up here right? If we're stressed out, it's right. If we start hyperventilating, if we're heavy breathing, it's all in our upper chest. We're also very, very good at inhaling and not exhaling. Anybody find out that they're holding their breath when they're stressed out? You just stop breathing and it's just, oh, I'm just going to live right here in the, the no air zone, right? Or if we get startled by something, it's it's this sharp intake of breath and it's all up here. So when you take it, when you're, when we talk about like deep belly breathing or meditation or diaphragmatic breathing, one of the easiest ways, if you're not, if you're not used to doing it, and again, I'm gonna adjust my camera so you can see. If you take your hand and you put it right on your diaphragm, right underneath your chest, and you take your other hand and you get comfortable and you just relax. And if you, when you take a deep breath in through your nose, you want this hand to move and this hand to stay still. And then when you exhale, you're gonna exhale through pursed lips, like you're blowing out a birthday candle. So it's. Using your diaphragm and your abdominal muscles to push all of that air out of you. Then you pause for as long as it's comfortable for you. And then you're gonna intake again through your nose, inhale, inflating your diaphragm. So I'd like you guys to actually practice this. Get into any comfortable position you possibly can. Put one hand on your upper chest and one hand on your diaphragm, just on your like, just above your belly button, and really take a deep, slow breath through your nose, letting your belly push out. So what do you guys notice with breathing like that? I don't know if I'm doing it right, but I'm, all, I'm almost getting like lightheaded. <laughs> yes, lightheaded, okay. exactly. I was gonna say, anybody else get dizzy? Yeah. yeah. Takes a long time, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, that's a long breath. Yeah. Right. So what that's actually doing is because we're so used to like when we hyperventilate, when we're stressed out, we don't obviously we don't think about how we breathe. What it does is we do live in that upper that upper body. Right. So it's it's a lot of here. Maybe you start to feel tension in your chest. That's really loud. Long, long. My windows are closed. 
Um, <laughs> So it's it's a lot of upper it's a lot of upper respiratory. So when we're doing this and you are forcing yourself to take a deep breath, it's slowing it down. And what you're doing is actually activating your parasympathetic nervous system, and that's your body's break. So remember we talked about earlier the sympathetic nervous system is like the gas, right? That's the accelerator. That's what's going to help you get here. Taking those slow, purposeful, deep breaths, inflating that diaphragm, and then expelling all of that air. That's activating that parasympathetic nervous system because you don't breathe like that when you're not stressed. So by breathing like that, you're telling your brain, I'm safe, I'm okay, it's time for us to calm down. Does that make sense? So meditation, I am a big proponent with meditation. It does help you reduce stress. It really does help you appreciate the moment, stay in that present mind. We are so sometimes focused on what we have to get done, not necessarily where we are in the moment. It's that kind of stop and smell the roses cliche, but it really is taking a minute and just being present in your body, knowing what's going on with you, taking that moment, checking in with how you're feeling, what you're thinking about right now, it does help you concentrate. It does help you sleep at night. And it does actually help you increase your immunity because one of the side effects of excess cortisol is a reduction in immune function. So has anybody ever had like a really stressful week, really, really stressful week, or maybe you've got midterms or finals coming up or you've got a big presentation or maybe your dissertation proposal's coming up or something, and then you're spending all this time focusing or your comps, focusing, studying, all this stuff, and then the second that it's over, bam, you get sick. That ever happened with anybody? All of a sudden you're like, I get the flu, and you're like, crap, what did I do? I haven't left my house. That whole time that you've been stressed out, that side effect of cortisol is that it actually interrupts your immune function. So then you become susceptible to everything that's flying around. Also, likely you haven't been sleeping, haven't been taking care of yourself the way that you should be. So all of these things are gonna decrease that immune function. So by meditating, it actually helps increase your immunity and helps you fight off diseases and it can help with your metabolism because again, that cortisol level is diminished in your bloodstream. So with the nutritional stress management, eating breakfast is a big thing. This doesn't have to necessarily be like your traditional breakfast breakfast, right? Breakfast is really just a breaking your fast. So whatever that looks like for you, that's the first meal of your day. It doesn't have to be in the morning. It can be, but it doesn't always have to be. But being mindful of what you're putting in your body. So carrying healthy snacks with you, um, decreasing your caffeine usage, especially a few hours before you go to bed, drinking more water. And this brown bag versus eating out used to be a little more, uh, it used to pertain more to when we were actually in person everywhere. But just keeping healthy snacks around you, even if you're at your desk, keeping something that's on hand that's not going to be like sugary or sweet or chips or something like that. Sleep hygiene is huge. Establishing a bedtime routine for yourself is going to help cue your body that it's time to sleep. So using your bed for only sleep or sex is a huge, huge thing. Don't study, don't read, don't do your work in bed. Your bed is used for sleep and sex and that's it. Because what happens is, is that if you use, if you live in your bed, because it's comfy and it's warm and everything you want is right there next to you, you're going to not associate that with bedtime. So when you lay down in bed, it's the same thing as when you were working. It's like, oh, well, this, this environment means that I do everything. So it doesn't make a difference why I'm here right now. Um, if you're not able to sleep, usually they say 20 minutes. If you're not able to go to sleep in 20 minutes, get out of bed. Really train your brain that this piece of furniture is for sleep. And when you get out of bed, don't turn any lights on. Don't get on your phone. Don't do something that's boring. Back when the phone book used to be delivered to our house, I used to say, read the phone book. If you have a phone book, great, read the phone book. If you don't have a phone book, maybe collect some like junk mail that you don't really read, but it's just like, I'm gonna just read through it anyway. Um, and then once you start to feel sleepy again, then you go back and lay down and go back to, you know, try to go back to sleep. After 20 minutes, if you're not asleep yet, get back up and go do that boring thing again until you ready, until you actually go to sleep. Coping and time management, this is such a big 
this is such a big thing, especially when you're in a PhD program or you're in a doctoral program, is maintaining a weekly planner. You know when you need to get things done, what assignments need to be done, and breaking it down into priorities, right? So we can't get everything done all the time. Like not all in one day. It's unrealistic for us to, to set a giant lofty goal like that. So having something where it's like, okay, these are time sensitive. I need to get these done first. Um, or maybe this this one item that I have won't take me very long. So maybe I should get this off my off of my to-do list and just get it done. But also make sure that you're putting time in to eat and to sleep and to go to the bathroom and to travel and to have meetings and to maybe get up and stretch and actually put yourself into that schedule as well. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna end up increasing your burnout. So you have to you know, make sure that you're prioritizing yourself also. So a grounding technique that I love, I absolutely love this one. It's the five, four, three, two, one. I know it's super complicated, right? <laughs> um, five, four, three, two, one. This is, you wanna look for five things. So let me back up. A grounding technique is great if you start to feel yourself getting really overwhelmed in a moment. If you're just like, I have so many things to do and you start to feel like you're losing a grip on just about everything. Like I'm, I'm starting to get to that panic mode, right? Your anxiety is just spilling over. It's getting way too much. A grounding technique is a great way to literally connect your body back into your mind. And it's great because nobody knows you're doing it. You can do this anywhere. If you're in the middle of a doctor's office, unless you're physically counting things like one, two, three, nobody's going to know you're doing it. It's fabulous. So you want to look for five things that you can see. And it's not just, okay, I see coffee, water, I see, you know, it's, you want to look for tiny details. You want to look for specific details of things that maybe you've never noticed before or how maybe the light is reflecting off of a certain surface or how maybe the light in the, the sunlight is, you know, if it's streaming through a window, it's like, oh, it definitely looks different on my desk than it does on the carpet. And how does it look differently? And really pay attention. You're slowing that, that visual down and you really want to look at those little details that you've never really noticed before. Then once you've done that for five different items, then go to four things that you can feel. And you want to maybe notice the sensation of clothing on your body or when you're taking your walk or taking your dog out or going for a run. How does the sun feel on your skin? Is it cold outside? Where are you noticing the temperature differences? What feels warmer to you? What feels cooler to you? Where, like, how does, how do your feet feel in your shoes, right? How, when you're sitting down at your desk and you're taking those moments to stop and really pay attention to yourself, do you feel, what does it feel like to be completely supported by the furniture that you're on right now? Where do you feel the impacts of the, of the, the pressure, right? So you want to really notice all of those things. And then three things that you can hear. This is where you get to do, you get to pay special attention to sounds that you normally don't hear. So you can stretch your hearing and make it kind of a superpower of like, how far can I hear? So for me, I can hear the fan on my laptop, which I've effectively tuned out. Um, if I really listen, I can hear birds before I could hear the blonde people. Um, but you wanna really pay attention to things that you don't normally hear. Two things that you can smell, and this is just noticing what's in the air around you. Can you smell the air, uh, an air freshener or your own deodorant or your cologne or perfume? Um, if you're outside, you know, if you're in Atlanta, we can't control the smells that are around us. You know, they may not always be pleasant. However, we can notice them, <laughs> although we probably notice stinky smells more than we would, you know, notice pleasant ones, but it's there. And then one thing that you can taste. So if you're the type of person who carries gum or candy or small snacks around with you, put it in your mouth and really pay attention to the flavor of it. Likely you'll discover something that you hadn't noticed before. Like where do you taste it most? Do you feel it towards the front of your mouth or the back or the sides? If you're a person who doesn't do this, I like to substitute this one with name one thing about you that you like, and it can't be physical. And if you use this more than once, you can't use the same thing twice. So you can't be like, I'm a nice person. I'm a nice person over and over and over again. 
really dig deep. What is something about you that you really like? And hopefully you don't get stuck on this one. Hopefully we can all think of a few things that we like about ourselves. But this can be sometimes difficult if, you know, you're having you're having a really bad day. But other than that, I'm sure we can all figure something out. This is another grounding technique that I really like. Um, this one is you pick a category, any category, and you give yourself, say, about a minute time put it on your phone everybody has their phones nearby so nobody's going to notice if you do this just put a timer and name as many movies as you can in your mind just have it that flip of a rolodex of the name of movies or countries or sports teams or just any category and what all of this is doing these grounding techniques it's activating that prefrontal cortex all of this right here that executive functioning that planning that organization is all activating here so when you do this, let's say that you pick movies and you're really good at it and you're just naming off the same movies over and over again, try alphabetizing them. And it'll slow down your, it'll slow you down a lot more. So for roller coaster breathing or starfish breathing, or this can work for yourself. It can also work if you have like little people, maybe they call you mom or dad or maybe niece and nephew or whatever. This also works for kids too, is basically what I'm saying. But it works for people who are tactile also. Um, so if you're doing a starfish, it's your hand, right? And you do, you start here and it's the same diaphragmatic breathing. You just take an inhale here and you run your finger up your hand to your finger. This helps ground, you know, because you're, you're feeling your hand too. Hold, and then you're doing your purse exhale. And you do that five times. If it's an older kid, they're like, starfish is, you know, starfish are lame. You go, okay, want to do a roller coaster? Let's do a roller coaster. And then you just do the upper part. You just go like this, like, wee down, up and down. I would really recommend don't do the, because then the kid's going to hyperventilate, pass out. You're going to hyperventilate, pass out. And then, you know, that's not going to help anybody. So, but just in case you guys want to, you know, breathe with little people or do it yourself. I do this sometimes too. So positive self-talk. This is where we can really change our perception and the way that we, we view things. So if you have a negative self-talk of like, I've never done this before, right? Because then we kind of fill in the blank of, and I'm going to fail at it, or I'm not going to do a good job. Usually that's the, the tail end of that thought. That way to spin it is, this is an opportunity for me to learn something new. I've never done it before, so let's learn something new. Um, I'm too lazy to get this done. You know what? I didn't schedule myself any bathroom breaks or meal breaks or anything like that, and I just wasn't able to fit it into my schedule today, but I will work it in tomorrow. I will attempt to work it in tomorrow, right? Just because you don't get something done or get all of these, you know, your long to-do list completed in a day because we're human and we have to take time or maybe some things just take longer maybe your commute took longer than you know we anticipated i mean it, it is atlanta anything happens in atlanta on atlanta traffic so sometimes things just take longer and you weren't able to fit it into your schedule but instead of that self-criticism and that negative self-talk of i'm too lazy or i didn't get any of this done i just couldn't get it in today that's okay i'm gonna do i'm gonna rearrange some things and i'll get it done tomorrow it'll it, it will get done um you know, or that I'm not getting any better at this. I've done this a couple of times and I'm just not getting any better at this. It's like, you know what? Let's try it again. Let's look at it maybe from a different angle because it's too complicated. Let's try it from a different way. Let me get some support. Let me get some help. That's where you activate your support system. Let's try it a different way, right? It's just that opportunity for you to switch the way you're talking to yourself, switch the way that you're viewing the situation and just bringing it a little little positive spin to it where it's still the same thing but it's not as harsh on yourself so really what it is is that you just need to find that balance you need to find a balance of what you need to do and then also what you need to do for yourself that self-care putting yourself you know first putting your own oxygen mask on before anybody else's you know sometimes you have to take care of yourself so that you can get everything else done Right. And it's just finding that balance of how to do it. And if that means going for a run or taking your dog for a walk or meditating or yoga or whatever, that's going to help you find that balance so that you don't burn out so that you're not, you know, living with your shoulders by your ears. So you're not having a migraine that debilitates you for the rest of the day or so that you're not nauseous and you can eat your healthier foods. 
I know Georgia State has a ton of different stuff. Uh, they did, they have like career services, they have academic advising, they have tutors and writing labs, they have all kinds of stuff to really help um, support you. And then there's us, there's the Counseling Center. So for anybody that is a Georgia State student, they get short term up to 15 sessions of individual or couples counseling at no charge. Uh, we also have group counseling and that you can do um, we have different groups offered over the semesters. Um, we do have same day appointments. So, you know, we also have a center for mindfulness. We have all kinds of stuff. So if you if you need extra support like this tree does, uh, please feel free to to seek it out. We are absolutely here for you. Um, also, we have psychiatry. We also have nutrition services. So if you find that maybe your burger eating is a little more than your salad eating um, or your healthier choices and you just want some assistance or you want some help, we have nutrition services as well. Um, you can follow us on any of our social media platforms at, at BeWellGSU. On Mondays, we have Mindful Mondays and we do like mindful meditation walks. Um, usually we do them live. So a bunch of people, you know, like one person will usually have their phone out and they'll be on live, like Instagram live and they'll answer questions or they'll talk and stuff like that. And it's a good way for us to, you know, to still be together. We can all go for walks in the morning and just kind of like, you know, share our video, you know, share our thoughts and, and things that we're seeing at the time. Also, we have, um, just all kinds of different campaigns that we do throughout the, throughout the year. So it's, it's a really great way of, of you know, creating a community. And speaking of community, we also have Together All. Together All is an online, it's a peer-to-peer -peer mental health and self-help uh, support community. This is something you would sign up with your, with your GSU email and it's anonymous. You can talk to people about what's going on. It's really just to, to people have been loving it. It's a way for people just to get on there and just talk and communicate and just be a community. And it is monitored by mental health professionals, but it's mostly, it's not like moderated, but it, it definitely is monitored because if somebody starts to talk about things that are maybe just a little too heavy or there's some warning signs that are going on, we're able to kind of like pull, you know, pull people aside and like, hey, are you okay? And, you know, maybe you need some additional support and things like that. So it doesn't feel, it's not too, too heavy, if that makes sense. So... Does anybody have any questions, any feedback, anything like that? Um, so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, you mentioned that uh, don't have a nap in the day. So uh, is there yes. a particular reason for that? Because sometimes it just feel really sleepy and having a 20 minute nap. I mean. Okay. Yes. So if you have trouble initiating sleep at night, then napping during the day is not going to be a great thing for you to do. However, some people cannot get through the day without a nap, and that is okay. Usually, if you can't, if you are going to nap, it's don't do it past three o'clock in the afternoon if you're trying to go to sleep at like say 10, 11, 12. So three, four o'clock is like your absolute cutoff for your nap, and try not to make it longer than like maybe an hour and a half. So if you have to take a 20 minute just reset cat nap, that's fine. It's more of the it's it's more of the people that when they take a nap, like they go to sleep. Like okay. a three it's not a three hour nap. That's a sleep cycle, you know? Right. So that's that's more of what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, can you talk a little bit more on the um thinking about thinking the metacognition and how that um how the S STOP step would differ with that uh, metacognition? So the metacognition, when you're thinking about how you're thinking, that usually ends up with some anxiety or some self-criticism that comes along with it. So when that's the constant, like, what does this mean about me? Or I can't stop thinking about this. What does that mean about me that I can't stop thinking about this? Why am I constantly obsessing over this one thing? Why can't I just get myself to stop? Anytime you ask yourself why, it's a judgment. Any single time. Because when you're saying why, you're inherently saying that what I'm doing is wrong. So when you... Are, it's like, you know, okay, like I, I've, I've been stuck on this forever and I'm going to step away from it for a little bit. 
And when you do the stop, it's really thought stopping, just period. It's I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk away and I'm going to go do something to distract myself, whether that means you're going to maybe go get something to eat and hopefully not think about it or do maybe play a game on your phone or get up and just observe how your body is feeling and getting up and moving, maybe go take a walk or sitting out in the sun. So those things, when you're doing that, you're trying to exercise your focus. When you're thinking about your own thinking or what that means is really the, the inference of that, it's, this, it's a constant cycle that you're just literally looping around. And stopping and taking a moment and, and purposefully doing something else is gonna help break that cycle. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Why we all do this judgment too. part that helps. Yeah. Us. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of, because that's the, that's the unspoken part, right? It's this, why can I not like, why can I not get over this? Why can't I stop this? Why can't I any that, that why you're just inherently saying I'm wrong. There's something wrong with me that I can't stop doing this. Anything else? So I've, uh, oh, go ahead, Sophie. Okay, uh, thanks, Sarah. Sarah, I was just a short question. Uh, could you um, talk a little bit more on focusing? Because I feel like it's especially work from home. I find it just, I, I tend to be distracted very easily by some minor things. I know I shouldn't pay immediate attention to those, like, some email, sometimes even a junk email. I got mad at a white kidney sending me the junk email. <laughs> but I just cannot help myself. Although I try to put my phone in another room, like doing all the stuff that, yeah, I'm just really bad at all this. So actually what I just heard was several judgments from yourself. So I shouldn't be, I shouldn't do this, right? I'm bad at this. So that judgment is actually already gonna, it is gonna already stick in your mind, right? So, so with, so when you're working, if you're finding that you're unable to focus and concentrate on something, really maybe take a minute and, and really like take that second and go, why am I, why am I having such a hard time right now? Not why can't I do this or something's wrong with me? It's what's going on that I'm having trouble focusing and concentrating. Is it that maybe you are sick of sitting in front of your laptop for the last eight hours? <laughs> It might just be that you need to just get up and walk away for a second, get, like set a timer and say, you know what, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to play Candy Crush on my phone. <laughs> or uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go sit outside and I'm going to listen to music and that's all I'm going to do. And you allow yourself that time, those breaks, those mental breaks, so that when you come back, you're like, okay, I'm ready now. I'm ready to do this. Because when you find that you're getting distracted, I, I don't know how many times I've sat with a blank Word document in front of me and saying, I know what I want to say, but for the life of me, I can't put together a coherent sentence to save my life right now. And I don't know how I'm going to be a doctor because I can't write a sentence. And then you walk away and you go do something and then you come back and your fingers have a mind of their own and you're able to just type, right? You're able to just get it all out. So sometimes you just need that taking those moments and it's the same thing as that stop taking that moment and like what is going on why am i having such a, not even why i'm clearly having difficulty here yeah what's happening that i need to i need to do do i do i need to eat do i need to drink do i need to use the restroom do i need to just walk away from here have i been studying this this book to the point where i don't actually know what any of these words mean anymore and without the judgment, without any, with, it's the judgment that gets us. It's that judgment of what's deficit, what, what deficit do I have? What's wrong with me that I can't get this done? Because clearly everyone else is doing a better job than I am, right? Like they're all getting this done. They've already studied. They've already done the entire syllabus. And here I am, I'm stuck on chapter one because I don't know what words mean, right? <laughs> without that judgment of just, hey, what's, what's going on? What's, you know, what's going on me? What's happening? So on sort of the flip side of that, what if we're doing what what happens? What advice do you have if we're doing that too much? The what's going on with me or the well, distracting? The distract saying like, you know what? I just I just need 20 minutes. You know what? I need 20 more minutes. You know what? I you know, I, I'm just done for like I'm shot for the day. I can't do any more for the day. 
Uh, and so you, you sort of put it off like, okay, I'm going to have the rest of this hour or the rest of this day as, you know, my time for me. Uh, but then you sort of slough everything off until the next day and then you do it again. <laughs> so this, this, yeah. So that's where the, the, the procrastination comes in, right? Like, okay, now I just need, I need a time for me. That can actually be beneficial sometimes. So there are some times where it's, you know what, I'm, I'm not getting anything done today. I do need, to, I, I clearly need to take some time for myself. I'm going to go out. I'm going to go get lunch. I'm going to go do something else. Um, it's really, it's, it's setting that time management. It's, it's giving yourself a realistic time management planning, making sure that you're doing the things, you know, cause sometimes we see things that they're time sensitive. We need to get them done first, but they're going to take a really long time. Right. There are other things that are not due maybe for a month or a week, but it's going to take us like two minutes, right? It's going to take us just a few minutes for us to get it done or write an email or follow up with somebody. Sometimes doing the things that are going to be quicker so you can take them off your list are things that you can get, can actually get that ball that ball rolling. You know, you can like start to feel productive, like, oh, I don't have a mountain of things. And also breaking things into meaningful chunks. So if you have 200 pages to read for a class or you have 30 page you know, papers to grade and you've got this mountain of things to do, sometimes by just saying, you know what, I'm going to do two today. I'm going to just do two of these papers. I'm going to read two of these essays. I'm going to read, you know, 15 pages or 20 pages. And then I'm going to go do, you know, go do something else or I'm going to go shift gears and do something else and breaking it into those manageable chunks. Sometimes you can, you know, read two essays or grade two essays and you're like, you know what, I got another two in me. Let's take another two of these. Or you know what, I've got another 15 pages in me. But really it's that getting started. It's just that getting started. And it's not that you have to read all 200 pages. You don't have to write a whole 300 page, dis page dissertation all at once. You don't have to do all of this all at the same time. It will eventually get done, but it's just the same thing as like, how do you do anything else? How do you start walking a mile? How do you eat an elephant, right? You do it one step at a time, one bite at a time. It's one task at a time. I guess, uh, so my personal problem, and I don't know if I'm sure somebody here also has this issue where um, you have that intention for the week, right? Where yeah. you, you'll you break it up into chunks, but then you don't get to, to all... 15 pages today. So you, it, it mounts up and it just mounts up and mounts up and mounts up. And so like, I have a tendency to uh, sort of to, to leave things to the last minute and then to, you know, work really hard and really long and, you know, pull all nighters and whatever, and then burn out. And then I have to take like several mental health kind of chunks of time to be able to then do it again. And so rather than having like an even keel of solid work, I have these roller coaster waves of like totally burning out and then feeling really depressed and like, like, you know, working really hard and then like totally burning out. So. So I do the exact same thing. I call it being a functional procrastinator. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's I'll get it done. It's just, I have a, I have trouble doing something unless I'm slightly stressed, right? Like I need that timeline link right here in my ear for me to get anything done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I do, I do, um, I have the same issue. I do the same thing. I really do. What I end up doing, and I, this is only for myself, and this, the, the thing is it works differently for everybody. So for me, I set my own deadline. And it's, this has to get done by this day. And if this doesn't get done by this day, then you have to have a repercussion. So maybe it's that you don't have, you don't get to go out. Maybe you have to keep your phone out of your room. Maybe you don't get to do, like, you don't get to go whatever it is that you wanted to do. You don't get to go for your walk or you don't get to do yoga because now you don't have time, right? So it's one of those things where I end up, I end up setting those goals for me where, like, when I had to do my dissertation, I was like, I have got to get this done by Sunday. That's it. I have to get it done by Sunday. Yep. And it's going to go to my advisor and like holding yourself accountable because I cannot work unless I'm stressed. There's just something, there's something there where it's like, it, I have to have it in my ear. Yep. So I don't know if that'll help for you, but setting like a goal and then there has to be a repercussion because if there's no repercussion, it's like, eh, I'll get done. Right. You're there's no real natural down. consequence to this. You just keep messing with <laughs> you. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, I don't want to I don't want to like keep you guys longer than than you're supposed to with your class. But um, thank you so much for having me here. I really enjoyed your participation. 
um, I'll send you um, I'll send you that link with the survey and everything. If you guys could please fill it out, we use it for our numbers. Great. And um, yeah, yeah, it was great. Are you able to share your slides? Yeah, well? absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, because I know there were some links on there um, on on those on those pages. Um, absolutely. But um, yeah, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Uh, I'm I know that that, um, you know, this was a valuable <laughs> session for, for everybody on this call, um, because it's, it's, it's one of those things where I think that it's easy for us to know that mental health is important and that stress management is something that, you know, we have to deal with, but just, I don't know, I feel like having the reminders is just always helpful to not feel mm -hmm. so sort of alone and overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your week. This is a wonderful way to start off a Monday, right? <laughs> Stress yes. management on a Monday. That just goes hand in hand. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much, Heather. We really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.